You know, originally I had the UK versions, and after I finished the series and loved it, I got these matching US covers. And someone asked me, is there any difference between these and the UK edition? I said, yes, there's a lot less of the letter U. History is a value. If more of us took heed of the mistakes of the past, well, the future could be a different thing. I shall stay and tell my tale and hope that it may serve some purpose, that I shall see it and learn, and that the future will not repeat the mistakes of the past. That is my prayer. But what use is prayer to a God that has abandoned all things? Both the brave man and the coward feel the same. The only difference between them is that the brave man faces his fear and does not run. War is good for business. People get reminded that we're not here forever. They like to enjoy life a little more, make the most of it. There is only now, this moment, and the one that follow. To my thinking though, it's what happens before death that's important. All of us die, but how many really live? Your whole experience has been death and misery, failure and yet more death, and still you refuse to face the truth? It will be a dark day, a bloody day, a proud day for this day of our wrath. And sometimes it's not about the winning, but it's about how you lose. This world may be full of greed and tragedy and darkness, but I am fortunate beyond measure to have such people about me. Family, friendship, loyalty, these things have been my guiding stars, my light in these dark times. You can tell much about a man by the company he keeps, by his friends and his enemies. There is a hole in your heart, an empty space. You must fill it with meaning. You need a cause to live for, to fight for, perhaps to die for. Sometimes it is hardest to see what is right in front of us. Sometimes it is best just to accept what is and get on with doing. Whatever your cause, lies are a coward's way, and they are like poison. They bring death. Death of trust, death of honor, death of respect. Memory is a double-edged sword. It can keep you strong through dark times, but it can also cripple you, keep you locked in a moment that no longer exists. Don't punch at all if you can help it, but if you must, punch first and punch hardest. It is a serious thing taking a life, a sad thing, I think, though better to take another's than to lose your own. Should have? Forget that. There is only now and what happens next. Truth and Courage. Hey, what's up, bookworms? Mike back today with another Why You Should Read. This time, guys, for one of my top 10 fantasy series of all time, guys. This, of course, is The Faithful and The Fallen by John Gwynn, released between 2012 and 2016. This is Malice. This is, see if I can do this without dropping it. This is Valor. This is Ruin. And this is Wrath. I'm just surprised I had them in the right order to do that here. So, uh, yeah, this was the first series set within the Banished Lands by one John Gawain. He did continue it later with a Blood and Bone trilogy, but has since moved on to other pastures. But, guys, I love this series. Like you, I get a lot of my recommendations from Patrick, and he was the one who first put this one on my radar way back when I was still really pretty much new at this whole booktube thing. It's one of the earliest series I did tackle on the channel and I read it immediately after I finished Wheel of Time in 2020 and I just blew through it because it is just such an amazing series guys and that's what we are here to talk about today. So for those who do not yet know what is this series about, well a black sun is rising. Young Cordman watches enviously as boys become warriors under the king's rule, learning the art of war. He yearns to wield his sword and spear to protect the king's realm, but the day will come all too soon when he will learn the price of courage. The Banished Lands has a violent past where armies of men and giants clash shields in battle, the earth running dark with their heart's blood. Although the giant clans were broken in ages past, their ruined fortresses still scar the land. But now giants stir anew, and the very stones weep blood, and there are sightings of giant worms. Those who can still read the signs see a threat far greater than the ancient wars. Sorrow will darken the world as angels and demons make it their battlefield. Then there will be a war to end all wars. The high king summons his fellow kings to council, seeking an alliance in this time of need. Some are skeptical, fighting their own border skirmishes against pirates and giants. But prophecy indicates darkness and light will demand two champions, the Black Sun and the Bright Star. They would be wise to seek out both. For if the Black Sun gains ascendancy, 
mankind's hopes and dreams will fade to dust. Guys, takes us all the way back to 2012 with the first book in the Faith of Fallen, Malice. And this is a series, guys. It's just, just wild, and I can't wait to talk about it reason I've waited to talk about this series for so long, guys, because it's going to be hard for me to do this in under half an hour because there's so much to talk about. But let's begin, like usual, guys, let's talk about what makes this series good or bad, starting with the good. The character arcs in this are amazing, guys. They are on Song of Ice and Fire level. The way that these characters begin this story and they go through everything in this series and the way they are when you close those final pages of wrath you will feel like you have gotten to see someone's full-on life because the way he writes these characters just their fledgling beginnings to the grizzled veterans they become is just incredible you see these preteen teenage characters you know kind of start off and go it, you know it's just kids who know nothing about the world who just want to just have a place in their small village and seeing where they come all the way through this passing of the torch from the previous generation just incredible growth that he shows this series so it's just showing that transformation you know kind of from their coming of age uh you know into their adult uh, into their adulthood and becoming the decision makers for what would be the future of the banished lands here is just amazing amazing stuff but i think it's really neat that the older characters are amazing too they're never really just there to feel like they're placeholders for this younger group and they're important and they're intelligent this isn't one of those ya series where every adult is a moron and the preteen knows everything not at all it is very much a coming of age story in many regards, but the older characters have a huge part to play in this series, and they are incredibly important. They are incredibly layered, and they are have some of the best stuff in the entire series. I call it a good thing, but there's the sheer number of characters in this series because it just makes the world feel so large and massive, and there's just so much going on. And I feel like he does a good job differentiating them. You will feel like a lot of names when you first start this series, but you will never have a problem knowing who is who after a while. It does take a little bit for you to kind of get that stripe, but once you do, you'll slip right in, just like you would like a Song of Ice and Fire, knowing what territory, what regions are these people from, what are their back here histories, why are they warring with one another you know you'll get all that as time goes by you'll get a little bit more information as it goes but it will seem like a lot at first but trust me he gets to a point where i'm never confused they feel differentiated enough that i know who is who and i know who doesn't like who and that is the important part here but i love the number of characters and how they change over the course of this series you'll see you know for example we got uh, Corbin, Kaiwen, uh, Veritas, uh, Nathair, they're kind of like the coming of age point of view characters in this. They are the kind of bigger players, and there's several, but they're kind of the bigger players, and you will kind of see the series kind of grow with them as they do enter into adulthood. But then you got Maquin, you got Gar, you got Fidel, you got Lycos, you know, kind of the, the old guard or the current rulers and seeing their point of view and what the world is like. They're a little bit more jaded, obviously, than our younger characters will be. And it just gives so much depth to this story because you're seeing it from different different, uh, I guess you say different generations, different age brackets and seeing how they view the banished lands. And it is a grim, quite a grim place, but you know, you will see the optimism versus the jaded pessimism versus some of those older characters and just the different outlooks on life uh, between all those older characters as well. And I think that's very, very important. I just love the way that all the relationships develop in this book, be it romantic, be it friends to enemies, be it enemies to lovers, just the redemption arcs in this, the betrayals, the backstabbing, the, uh, the, the the unforeseen alliances, things like that, just revenge and things that would just be so satisfying and so misery-inducing because bad things will happen a lot in this world, but there are some moments that really will just have you kind of just pumping your fist because you are growing along with these characters, and when they have those moments, you feel like celebrating with them. Animal Companions, that's always something that's really special to me. But this doesn't just have the greatest hits. Yes, it has a wolf. Yes, it has a horse. But there are other Animal Companions in this that I'm not going to spoil for you. I'd like to find you to find out on your own what those are. I'll say they're very original. And at the, at the point that I had read this, I had never seen anything else like that with some of the Animal Companions that he does choose to use in this. But they play a pivotal, pivotal role in this story and uh, i just couldn't get enough of it i always am here for more animal companions especially when you have multiple animal companions i i do love that uh, as far as the content i guess you would call it noble dark i know a lot of people have been asking me like is this series grim dark is it ya what is it i guess you would call this noble dark i was trying not to break it down like that noble dark it says flawed characters that are uh, you know striving to maintain their moral compass in a, a kind of terrible circumstances. I, I think that would be the best explanation. I feel like, uh, say if you have Brandon Sanderson right here and you have Joe Abercrombie right there, John Gwim can be somewhere right in the middle. You know, he is, uh, characters are 
going to die. There's bad things going to happen to them. But he's going he's to avoid the bad language and the overly sexual content and things like that. So I feel like it is very much adult fantasy. And there is it is a brutal world. Don't get me wrong. He's just not going to spend too much time telling you how the sausage is made and just kind of linger there like a Joe would. And he's also not going to make up, you know, goofy curse words like a Brandon Sanderson word would. And I think that fits in his world, but it wouldn't fit in this one. So uh, I think this is a good medium place there. And uh, I, I think if you're worried about things like major over trigger warnings, I don't think there's very much here. There are a few violent moments in the books. You do have people's heads getting lopped off all the time. But like I said, he implies it more than tells you exactly the details of all of it. He doesn't talk about, you know, the entrails coming out and things flipping around when their heads get cut off. He's, he's not really going too much into detail, but he, there, there, are, there are violent things in here as war would dictate, obviously. But uh, yeah, as far as uh, the comfort zone, I feel like if you aren't quite ready for like a first log yet, and you think you're above like a Brandon Sanderson level, I think this would be somewhere right in the middle, but just, just that sweet spot. Because there is clear cut uh, good and bad guys. I don't think it's hard for you to look at which characters and say, oh yeah, that guy's a piece of shit. You know, it wasn't hard for you to do that. And it isn't hard for you to say, okay, this is my coming of age hero. You know, my, my farm boy leaves home kind of storyline. I, I feel like it's not hard for you to get that, but the characters, they aren't exactly out to, they aren't all out to save the world, you know? So it isn't quite as noble, I think, as you would think other stories are. So that's why I think that's the noble dirt classification. I don't know. That stuff gets really, really Harry for me. I just like to say, guys, it's adult fantasy. It's just not R-rated adult fantasy is the way that I would put it. But I will say that no character is safe. And it's uh, everybody's on the chopping block. Man, woman, child, it does not matter to John Gwynn. I call him old Vicious Pin because he has no problems taking characters away that you love. And the body count, guys, it is on a George R. R. Martin level. The body count is extremely high. Now, a lot of people will say, well, you have this many characters in your story. That way you don't feel bad about killing them off. No, they matter. When they happen, they do matter. But yeah, the body count is high. The cast is large. And I will say some deaths are going to affect you worse than others, but some are going to hit you really, really hard where you're going to just feel like exhausted and have to put the book down for a minute because you're just so overcome. But that's because he's doing great character work. And uh, yeah, I, I, I can't say anything more than that. If you've got great characters and even if the body count's high, I'm not desensitized to it. That means you're doing a really, really great job writing them. But I love that this is just like a massive world. And John plays around that sandbox a lot. He takes you all over this continent. They'll have you just kind of pouring over the map in the front of the book. You go to all over the place of the course of these four books. Our characters go all around the world. And yeah, I feel like there's very much places that aren't left. And I think some he did, but he didn't really do. He did tackle some in a blood and bone. And I think it's a little different there, but that's a different series altogether. All you need to worry about right now is this is the beginning and the land is what the land is. And you will see there are remnants of a shrouded kind of past and you know some uh, myths and lore and things that you kind of learn about and you actually learn more about that as the course of the series unfolds but i do love that he takes you all around this 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 uh this world and he does it in the form of a good like treasure hunt now i love a good relic hunt for sacred items and he does that here in great ways i also love when you play with prophecy a little bit and what i mean by that is when you say that prophecy uh it's it's not wrong, but it can be misinterpreted sometimes. That's something I feel like he plays with really, really well. So you will get prophecy. You will get the relic hunt and things like that. You will get things that feel very familiar to traditional fantasy, but he makes it in a way that it seems very fresh, almost kind of that Michael J. Sullivan way where uh, this isn't anything I haven't heard of before. But I like the way that you're doing it because it really does make sense. I love the non-humans and the inhuman. Is that the way I would put it here? Because you got some great villains that are just bastards. I mean, they are just horrible, horrible human beings. Like I said, you have no problems deciding who is the good guys and the bad guys here. But again, not everyone is quite as morally black or morally white. There is a little bit more gray in there. And again, these characters aren't always trying to save the world, but they will try to do the, the, the right thing unless they are some of those inhuman ones. And then for the non-human characters, I mean, awesome stuff like giants riding giant bears and worms and other things other things i want to talk about dregs there's other things in this series that uh that again i don't want to ruin the surprise but just know that there are lots of creepy crawlies in the series that are very very exciting to read as a fantasy fan and we'll have you kind of googling what exactly is that and you'll be like oh i never knew that's what it was called hey you know what honestly i'll be honest and this is the american to me i never knew that a baron was a child before i read this series so uh, we all learn some new things so uh, I, I do love that it's so fast paced guys it just has these quick snappy chapters this series is the essence of 
one more chapter, one more chapter, one more chapter. Next thing you know, you've went through 200 pages and it's you know 2 a.m. You've got to go to work in a few hours. And it, I have seen very few, maybe Red Rising is the only thing I've seen do it that well to where you're always, you got, I got to quit in the middle of a chapter because I know the way he ends these chapters, I've got to keep reading the next one. And you feel like because they are short, you can just do one more chapter every time. It's just so fast paced. And I love how much you can just get in in a single sitting because these books, they're bricks, but you'll get through them really, really quick. But no book series is perfect, right? So let's talk about some of those things that might not work for you. I don't like to say, you know, I might need to change the name of this category from good or bad. Because I always say I don't necessarily call them bad. But there's some things I think you might need to be looking out for. Now, these didn't necessarily bother me, but I do hear some complaints about how it takes too long to get going. Now, if you have read any traditional fantasy whatsoever and you know you start at a small level and you get used to everybody's way of life that way when it all goes to shit you understand you sympathize with the character well that's prevalent here you do spend some time with our heroes at their small village at the beginning of the story getting to know everybody seeing what their life is like so he takes his time setting up this world it never bothered me I, again, I have read Lord of the Rings. I've read Wheel of Time. I've read Shannara. You're used to those kinds of setups. Heard the same complaint with A Blood and Bone by, uh, not Blood and Bone. Uh, this is a series I get confused with that. A Blood and Fire by uh, Ryan Cahill. Is it is that kind of same setup where you have, you're getting used to these characters' daily lives. And that way, when the bad thing happens, you're like, oh no, you know, because you can, you can relate to them. So it doesn't just pop off immediately in chapter one like a lot of modern fantasy does. It takes its time to set up the world. I think it's better for it, but I know that has been a complaint that I have read and heard a few times. If you're not really into traditional fantasy, I, I, I think it might be something that's kind of hard for you because this will have a lot of things that feel derivative. There are things where it's accused of feeling derivative of A Song of Ice and Fire. There are some things where you can definitely say, huh, this feels very familiar to Bernard Cornwell in the Warlord Chronicles. Now, I've talked to John on the channel, and I know he is a big Bernard Cornwell fan, so I can see where that came from, especially when it comes to like the relic hunting and things like that. I love that. I love that he wears his influences on his sleeve, but to me, it never feels derivative. Definitely not. And I will say, with the, the Song of Ice and Fire comparison, it's a good comparison. I just don't think the story is anything like A Song of Ice and Fire. I, I can just see how fans of Song of Ice and Fire would really enjoy this. But again, I don't look at that as a negative. But outside of that, guys, there's not really very many things I can knock this series for, except that it ends too soon. I wish it would have been longer than four books. How about why you guys should read it? That's obviously why you're here. You're tired of other fantasy series and authors out there taking forever to finish your series? Well, I think that this might be something that you are looking for because the series is complete. It is a full story and you'll leave very satisfied. And if you want to keep going, there is a sequel trilogy to it that takes place, well, later. Let's just leave it there. I don't want to give you away, give away too much there. But uh, again, what I said was it's not similar to Song of Ice Fire, but I think Song of Ice and Fire fans will like it. So again, if you're tired of waiting for that, you're tired of waiting for Gentleman Bastards to finish, you're tired of waiting for Sir Rothfuss to finish his series, I think this will be one that you'll be very satisfied going into it, knowing it is complete and it is a very well done story. And John Gwynn's beard is greater than Patrick Rothfuss's beard. I think that matters or something. So I think this is perfect gateway if you're transitioning from YA traditional fantasy. You're not quite ready to get into the really heavy hitters of Grimdark. I think that this will be one that's just perfect for you. It's adult. It has a large cast. It'll kind of ease you into that form of storytelling. And I think it's just a perfect gateway for epic adult fantasy with a large cast, a large world. And it's just an addictive world that you just cannot get enough of. And I just love those short and snappy chapters that you'll be able to get through really, really quick. So don't let the size of these books scare you off at all. As for my final thoughts, guys, I will never forget this adventure. One of those weirdest things was when I first discovered the series and heard what Patrick told me about it, I was like, that definitely sounds like something I'm going to work with. And at the time, he was finishing up the uh, Bloat and Bone series, John Gwynn was, and I bought all seven books. And I just knew for some reason, sometimes you just know that an author is going to click for you. At least I do. And I did on this one because I had a feeling that John Gwynn was going to be exactly what I was looking for. And he's uh, he's nine for nine with me, including his other series, Bloodsworn, so far. So John Gwynn is quickly becoming one of my favorite fantasy. He's definitely one of my favorite fantasy authors right now. And I can't wait to read the conclusion of the Bloodsworn saga because it all started right here. And I love those other series. I love Bloodsworn. I love the Blood and Bone guys. But Faithful and the Fallen is just on another tier for me. It is not only the best book series I think that John Gwynn has written, but it is one of the best fantasy series ever. It did make my top 10 uh, twice. I've done it twice now. He's made it both times. 
And it's a, it's a series I think is very much uh, deserving of being a top 10 series all time for me because it just I will never forget these characters, just these thrilling characters. And I just love the way that they grow over the course of the series. Amazing character work, superb questing. You got gods and monsters that I didn't even really get into. Like I said, trying to make this video under a half hour is hard. Something I've said that lately I was going to stop doing was try to reread so much because I got so many other things I want to read. I will reread this series one day. Definitely. Knowing the things that I know about it now, I will definitely go back and read it. Knowing things to look out for when you're in the early parts of the books because there is a lot of foreshadowing there, I think. And it's stuff that you feel like, I should have seen that. But you didn't because he's a good enough writer that he subverts your expectations enough that it doesn't feel like an insult. It's still surprising and it's satisfying. And I imagine going back and rereading it, you would see some things that you might miss the first go around. So truth and courage is something that is muttered quite a few times in this book, guys. And I will not lie, it has entered my regular vocabulary, I do use it on a constant basis to the point sometimes where my kids are like, will you shut up? <laughs> so it's something I feel like you will be using as well because it is more than just a mantra. It is a way of life. And I am so incredibly happy that I picked up the series. And I hope more of you will pick it up as well because I think it's going to click with just about everyone if you can get past some of those things I talked about. The huge cast, the huge world, feeling like it takes a little bit to get going. It's all worth it. It's an incredible journey. And I wish I could go back and read it again for the first time because I do truly love it that much. So guys, have you read The Faithful and The Fallen by John Gwynn? Drop in the comments, guys. Let me know what you think. Let me know if you have any other questions. I would love to answer them for you because I want more people to enjoy this wonderful, wonderful story. So truth and courage and drop in the comments and I will talk to you there.